morning. Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Del Mar on this uh, beautiful spring morning. At that little dusting of it's very much spring snow. I think that's a good sign. Uh, just uh, let us know that uh, we're almost we're almost there. Uh, call your attention to the announcements that are in the bulletin. Uh, yes, there is a special Sunday offering card. I'll uh, mention that uh, a little later in the service. Um, uh, just wanted to uh, point out that the uh, forum after worship today I will be leading, and it is about uh, gender identity and expression. Uh, so that will be down in Fellowship Hall. Um, have a chance to get some coffee and uh, refreshments, and then we'll hopefully start about quarter to 11. Um, uh, finance and stewardship uh, meets. Actually, I don't think we are going to meet this week. Probably we're not going to meet. So that's in there. Uh, we decided that uh, we can uh, take a, a Lent off. This piece of lights off, so uh, do that. Um, uh, let's see what else is there. Oh, and just uh, we have a couple more sessions of our Wednesday nights uh, potlucks and discussion group. And this week will be God said it. I believe it. That settles it. So you're welcome to uh, join us for that. Even if you haven't been there yet, uh, each session kind of stands on their own. So uh, you're welcome to stop in. And, uh, uh, and if you can't come stay for that, just come for dinner too. So uh, and so. Great uh, things brought by different people in the congregation, so uh, so that's been a lot of fun. Also, um, you'll see the order form for Easter flowers, and I just want to take a second on this. Uh, we're going to do this a little bit differently, so um, partly because we ended up with so many poinsettias at Christmas time, and then uh, nobody took any. So uh, we're going to still have flowers. But we are going to have you contribute to um, the Flower Slash Mission offering for Easter. So um, you'll still get a uh, memorial name in the bulletin and an insert. Uh, so that will be there. And instead of just offering a choice, uh, the first amount, uh, we will buy an appropriate number of flowers. Uh, not a lot, just some. So we will have them. And we're staying away from the more allergenic uh, flowers and uh, things for worship. Uh, so we'll have a few flowers, uh, some especially that we can reuse, and then um, the rest will go to Heifer International. And so uh, you just make a donation uh, that way, and that's how that's going to work this year. If you have any questions, you can check with uh, Jess in the office, and uh, hopefully she can help with that. If not, then she'll ask me uh, or check with Heather, and uh, you'll get an answer eventually. So uh, that's how that's going to work this year. And I believe that's all we have for now. So let us uh, find our hearts and minds for worship.
Good morning. Good morning. Please rise as you are able for the call to worship. In the darkest valley, at, at the banquet table, table, in the hard work of life, at, at the, the moment of peace, in our day-to-day -day reality, at times set aside, like this time, now, for worship, for listening, for paying attention, with every step we take, goodness and mercy follow us, our cups overflow. Please remain standing for the opening hymn. This is number 3001 in the Green Book, Worship and Song. It's actually the first hymn in the book. Amen. 
Hear these words of grace. The good shepherd knows the sheep, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, so that the sheep may live. We are part of the flock. We are part of Christ's body. In Christ, we find wholeness and restoration. Go forth and share this good news. Let us join in the Lord's Prayer as printed in the bulletin with the sung arrangement found on the inside cover of the United Methodist Temple, the large black book. Now, 
of a certain living in life. Anyone who lives in God no longer walks in the dark. Among children of the Lord, sons and daughters of God. Come all children of the Lord and hear the word of God. Good morning. Do I come back up, Luke? I'm here now. No? Okay. That's cool. Sorry. My microphones are unplugged over there for some reason. So we will get untangled, and then we'll fix that right after. Good morning, guys. How are you? There we go. Okay. All right. I finally settled. How's everybody doing today? Good. Good. So we are still in this season called Lent. You realize that? It's been a while, huh? You don't even know what I'm talking about. So this season called Lent started with Ash Wednesday and goes all the way to Easter. So it's a long time. And yet, Easter's coming pretty soon. We have one more regular week of Lent, one more regular Sunday next Sunday. And then it's going to be Palm Sunday, and then Holy Week, when we have Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and then it's going to be Easter. So for those of us who have to plan worship services, it's coming really soon, like too fast. But um, it still seems like we've been in Lent for a while, and we got ways to go. Advent's a much easier season, right? You remember Advent, that season leading up to Christmas? Right? And Advent's a little bit happier, right? And also it goes a little, a little bit faster, almost too fast sometimes, right? And Lent is a long time, right? And we also have these really long gospel readings that the grown-ups have had to listen to. I've actually cut them down a little bit, and then I talk more about them too. And Because um, if, if we stood up for the whole time for some of those, there's a whole chapter out of the Gospel of John, some of these readings. So they're really long. Lent is like a lot of work, and it's a, it's a hard road to get to. But when we think about it, what are we leading up to? What are some of the things, you remember some of the stories, some of the things that are going to happen to Jesus when we get to Holy Week? Zero. zero. You don't remember zero? You remember zero? Maybe some of the older guys did not. So what are the things, some, we, first of all, we got Palm Sunday. So what's, what, we got, what goes on on Palm Sunday? Exactly. So then when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and on the donkey and they put their some palm branches, they put the clothes down, like like rolling out the red carpet kind of thing. So we have that coming up on Palm Sunday. And then there's some hard stories. There's Jesus is betrayed. Who knows what betrayed means? Anybody know? It's hard to put into words about that, right? You know what it means, but hard to give to words. Yeah. What's that? Sort of like when, well, not when you lie as much as if somebody if somebody lies about you if they're really close to you. When somebody leaves you, that would be one, yeah, right? So betrayed means that you trusted somebody, right? They turned against you. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, exactly. So that's going to happen to Jesus. One of the people that was closest to him, Judas Iscariot does that. Right? And then somebody who's really close to him, Peter, is going to deny him, not once or twice, but three times. going to say, I don't know him. So that's going to happen. And then Jesus is going to be, that's when he's arrested, right? And then he, he has to, he goes through the trials, and they drag him here, they drag him there, and lots of people ask him questions. And then eventually he's crucified. And so there's a lot of difficult stuff that's going to happen to him. So not, nothing that bad is probably going to happen to us. Although sometimes people have some serious things that are going on in their lives, right? But we're just, this is our season of Lent, is to season to remember that Jesus went through an awful lot for us, right? And so we remember that through this season of Lent. So it's a long time to get to Easter. But you want to know one of the cool things is, I like to remind people of this, Easter is as long as Lent, 
Did you know that? So Easter's going to last a whole bunch of Sundays also. So we get all the way to Easter, we have this big celebration, and sometimes people forget that Lent is a really long journey, but then when we get to Easter, Easter's a long celebration. Easter goes all the way to Pentecost, so all the way from Easter, those are all Sundays, still Easter, still Easter, still Easter, Pentecost is also a big celebration. So it's a long way to get there. But even though we're probably going to, you know, have a special dinner for Easter Sunday, or we, in our house we have ours on Saturday, because by the time we get to dinner time on Easter Sunday, I'm just ready for it now. And so uh, we have ours on Easter weekend. We might have a big dinner. We might have family come. We might go visit family. We get what else happens on Easter? Anybody? Anything else happen on Easter? At your house? Easter Bunny comes exactly. Brings candy usually. Puts them in eggs and hides the eggs. It's just kind of crazy, right? Can you imagine if Santa came and brought presents and then like hid them and you had to go look for them? Would that be? Some parents are going. That would be interesting. Yeah. That'd be weird. Yeah. Right. Oh, Passover's around that time, too, yeah. So that, that's also, that's going to happen the same uh, time that we're doing, we're celebrating Holy Week. Yeah, so we'll talk about that a little bit later on, too. Okay? So, yeah, but so, even though Lent's a long time, we got a ways to get to Easter, remember that Easter is going to be a big celebration in a long time, too. Okay? All right, let's have a prayer before you put us on these call. Dear God, we thank you for all of the things that you do for us. And as we travel through this season of Lent, we ask that you can help us to remember that as much as we struggle, as long as the journey seems sometimes, that the celebration will be even better. We thank you for all that Jesus has done for us, and we pray in his name. Amen. All right, thanks so much for coming up, and have a good time at Sunday School with us. Sunday, uh, Encore United Methodist Committee on Relief, and um, uh, you'll notice that what you have in your bulletin looks a little bit different. So, uh, United Methodist Communications, instead of doing the separate envelopes for each special Sunday, uh, now has one special Sunday envelope and these uh, cards that go in for each of the special Sundays. So, um, that's going to require a little bit more of you in order to make sure we keep stuff straight. Um, because in case you don't put that uh, offering in today, you didn't bring your checkbook, you want to do that next week, whatever, it's really going to be important for you to put on the memo line of the check, UMCOR, okay? You don't just write U-M-C-O-R. Or um, if you put cash in, it would be really helpful if you grab a pen and write UMCOR somewhere, like right here on the envelope, okay? Just to be sure that it gets to the right special Sunday offering. Um, or you can even just circle UMCOR Sunday if you want. Uh, but it's really going to be important to make sure you do that. Um, along with that, I want to mention there is an opportunity, uh, and you may see this information out there, to give online. You can give online through our church website for the special Sundays when they come up. Um, and so you can do that. Uh, if that's the way you do your regular pledge giving, uh, you can do that that way. Or um, you can do it through uh, a couple of United Methodist websites. And if you do that, there's a place to put the name of your church. Please do that, because then we get credit for that, and they know that our church participated. And um, we happen to have the Peace with Justice uh, coordinator for Upper New York Annual Conference. Uh, Heather Smith is a member of our congregation. And um, I, I, so I know that the people who receive those funds keep track of participation rates. Uh, so it's really important that uh, they know that our church participated. 
because our church actually has a, a good track record of participating and, and uh, really supporting these special Sundays well. Just so you know, United Methodist Committee on Relief is our disaster response uh, organization within the United Methodist Church, uh, very well respected and beloved. Um, and this, the offering that comes in for this day um, supports all of the administrative costs and overhead. Uh, for example, they have warehouses where they store things like uh, flood buckets and other disaster recovery supplies. So it covers all of those expenses. That way, as you've heard pastors say this many times probably, whenever there is a need somewhere because of a natural disaster or something else that happens, 100% of your gift that you give then will go to support those in need because uh, offerings like this and some of our ministry shares cover all of the overhead and administrative costs. Uh, so, uh, and anything that's left over still also goes to support disaster relief in other ways as well. And so, uh, one of the things that we love and uh, celebrate, especially in the United Methodist Church, is United Methodist Community on Relief. So, uh, I commend this to you uh, for an opportunity to give. And the ushers will assist us now as we gather tithes and offerings. Guide us so that we will not regard others. 
according to outward appearances, and seek to find your love in their hearts. We dedicate our offerings and ourselves to contribute to the work of your kingdom on earth until Christ returns in glory. Amen. And please remain standing as you're able as we sing together again 451. Be thou my vision.
As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smeared the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went away and washed. When he returned, he could see. The man's neighbors and those who used to see him when he was a beggar said, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is. And others said, No, it's someone who looks like him. But the man said, Yes, it's me. So they asked him, How are you now able to see? He answered, The man they called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes, and said, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. They asked, Where is this man? He replied, I don't know. Then they led the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus made the mud and smeared it on the man's eyes on a Sabbath day. So the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. The man told them, he put mud on my eyes, I washed, and now I see. Some Pharisees said, this man isn't from God because he breaks the Sabbath law. Others said, how can a sinner do miraculous signs like these? So they were divided. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. If you remember the rest of this story, the man is passed along to others and they go and ask his parents what they know about the situation and not wanting to get into trouble. They say, he's an adult, go ask him. And the authorities call the man back and the man insists that Jesus is a prophet, someone who has brought God into his life and into his presence and into his body to offer him healing. And still they don't believe. Nobody listens to the man. Nobody hears his story. This person who has been an outcast, who is considered either a sinner himself or the product of sin. No one listens to him. No one pays any attention. Because they're so busy arguing about who Jesus might be. And how God is at work in the world. And whether this man himself was a sinner or the product of sin. And how could someone who's a prophet, someone who's a representative of God, someone who brings God into their midst, how could a person like that heal on the Sabbath? But if he wasn't who he said he was, then how could he heal on the Sabbath? And in the end, they're not able to accept what has happened. The only one who realizes what has happened in this moment is the person who was born blind. The person who's been an outcast, the person who has had to beg, who has relied on others for his very existence. Seems like not that long ago, and yet a long time ago. It was the special session of General Conference of the United Methodist Church in 2019. Anybody remember that? The special session when going in there was some hope that we might be able to find some common ground, that we might be able to find a way forward, that we might be able to find a way to offer acceptance 
find a way to recognize the full humanity of people who have been excluded intentionally by the church. And instead, we came out of that section having doubled down on the previous positions of the church that still exist in the United Methodist Church. We made it even more difficult for someone to be married. We made it even more difficult for someone to be ordained. To hear and respond to God's call. To commit to be in a relationship with another. And so at that time, I took my rainbow stole that has a United Methodist cross and flame on it, and you might notice there's a little something extra there. I took some black tape to express my grief and put it across the cross and flame. You know when a firefighter or police officer dies? They put a black band around their badges as a way of expressing grief. If I'd had a United Methodist flag, I would have flown it in half staff. Expressing my deep and profound sense of grief and hurt for the ways in which people were acting. Four years later, almost exactly four years later, that's still happening in the United Methodist Church. We thought maybe we'd figured out a way for people to leave gracefully who didn't agree. Didn't matter whether you didn't agree with the current positions of the church or if you didn't agree with the way the church has been living that out, whether you were on... This would be my left, the far left or the far right, or even somewhere in the middle. A gracious way to pe for people to exit. Instead, what that has turned into in the life of the church is an even deeper wounding of all of us. The sense of separation that we call disaffiliation. You've probably heard pieces of it, and I know there's a lot of confusion out there about it. On the other hand, if you're here in the Albany District of the Upper New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, you very likely don't know of any other churches that are disaffiliated. Someone recently asked me, just this past week, if my church had talked about that. Like, I don't think so. <laughs> Because you understand yourselves to be very United Methodist, but also a place of welcome and inclusion, a place where people are working hard to make space for a variety of voices, and especially people who have been marginalized and excluded. But in the life of the church, there have been and will continue to be, no matter what happens and where we go, these debates and discussions about who's in and who's out. Who has sinned or is the product of sin and who's right with God? Who's good enough to respond to God's call and to serve with fullness and who's not? That's a debate that's been going on for centuries just in the United Methodist Church. And we've only been around as Methodists for a couple centuries and a half. Whether or not women can preach, whether or not women can be ordained and serve as full members of the annual conference and in pulpits. And now whether or not Gay and lesbian people and transgender people can truly be called by God to serve as leaders in the church. 
In the midst of that, there are people who are trying to tell their stories and no one is listening. There are people that are trying to explain to us what it's like to be different than the majority of our society or our culture. To not be able to live in that binary that we like to have of black and white or male or female or blind or able to see. Not listening to their stories about what it's like to live in those in-between places or somewhere else. Not being able to grasp that the fullness of humanity looks different than my experience or your experience. Because we're created in the image of God. And God is so much bigger than that. The church is broken. And in many ways, people are afraid that the church is dying. If you go on my Facebook page, anybody who's on Facebook, you know you have that place to put a little bio? Mine says, every church should be a dying church. Every church should be a dying church. Self-preservation is not a Christian value. If you were to ask my kids, what has your dad preached over the last whatever amount of your lives? That's probably what they would tell you. Every church should be a dying church. Self-preservation is not a Christian value. Don't confuse that with self-care. You've heard me talk about the importance of self-care. But self-preservation is not the example that Jesus puts before us. We are to live for others. We are to give of ourselves for others. The purpose of the church is to give itself away, not to preserve the institution. That doesn't mean we're not good stewards of the things that have been entrusted to us, but we do that so that we have them available to serve the world around us, to serve the people on the margins, those who have been excluded, those who have no voice, no one's hearing their stories. The church is broken. The church as we've known it, that I grew up with, is dying. That's okay. I'm the same age as the United Methodist Church. I'm a lot different than I was 50 years ago. 54 years ago. Almost 55 years ago. <laughs> and so are we as a denomination. I'm a lot different than I was 10 years ago. And so are we. And I will be a lot different, hopefully, 10 20, maybe even 30 years from now. And so will we. Being the church is about being willing to let go and live into something new. Did you notice in the story, Jesus doesn't ask the man if he wants to be healed? And did you notice in the story that the man never asks? Jesus to heal him? It just happens. Jesus walks into his life and re restores his sight, offers him something new. And what happens in the midst of that? The man's life actually gets way more complicated. He is in the midst of a reformation. And so are we. When we walk with God, Christ walks with us. We don't need to be afraid. 
There are incredible possibilities in front of us to live into something new. As this congregation, as this district, as this annual conference, as the United Methodist Church, as disciples of Jesus, as people of faith. This church is a dying church. But just yesterday, I reread, because I was leading a memorial service here for Dr. Nathan Parker, those words in the funeral liturgy. Let us live as people prepared to die, and die as people prepared to go forth and live. baptism, through the season of Lent, through the days of Holy Week and Easter, we are about dying so that we can truly live. Amen. Amen. We rise as you're able as we sing together our final hymn, number 454, Open My Eyes and I May See.